back to Academy, everyone. Yay. Exactly. Um, so, so tonight we're starting a new um, series uh, because of the new session of the Academy. Speaking strictly. Um, so, what we're going to be looking at is a book by Chris Candia called Disciples. And those of you who know the words English and the words language, everyone knows that it's spelled wrong. See, it's got a Y in it. Why? Yeah, that's wrong. Why? Yeah. Why? Why? Exactly. Good question. Uh, it's called Disciples. Um, why I fall asleep when I pray and other dysfunctional discipleship things. I think it's actually a little bit better than that. But yeah, I'm just looking at dysfunctional discipleship traits. So, um, yeah, generally a bunch of us have chosen a topic from this book and um, we're going to be doing um, sessions on it. Um, and then, so there's a bit of a talk of it, and then there's a bit of a discussion of it at the end. Um, so we can all kind of have a wee chat about it and see what we're going to do. So I've picked um, chapter 8 to start with, because that's a good chapter to start with, I think we'll all know. Uh, which is disappointed why I can't move mountains. So, I can now start to talk. <clears throat> and I'll edit out these rubbish bits and it'll look really good on the end. So, you may have seen the film 127 Hours. Um, yeah. It sounded a bit wrong. It tells the true story of an experienced mountaineer called Aaron Ralston. He was climbing alone in Utah when a 360 kilo boulder pinned his arm to the face of a cliff, leaving him helplessly stranded. Unless he could either move his arm or the mountain, he was going to be stuck there helplessly stranded. He would die from dehydration and he knew it. Aaron prayed but it seemed to be in vain. Still, he and the mountain were both going nowhere. As days went by, Aaron knew there was only one option left. On the fourth day, he summoned enough strength steadied his nerves, and spent a couple of hours using his cheap, blunt pen knife from his backpack to hack his arm off. Amazingly, Aaron lived to tell the tale. Anyway, unfortunately, uh, many of us face problems in our lives just like that. Okay, not just like that. <laughs> uh, but lives that feel as immovable as that boulder that trapped Aaron from Aaron to the cliff. We pray, but there's no relief. When God fails to deliver, sometimes it seems as if our only option is to rely on our own resources and we're forced to take our own desperate measures to sort ourselves out. Answer prayer is an agonising experience. It makes us question ourselves and God and frustrates us in our discipleship. We know Jesus talked about moving mountains, but sometimes we feel as though our faith could hardly move a paperclip. In this story, the disciples tried to do the Jesus thing. And by the story, I mean the one from that's fought. Uh, talk about. Um, but they failed, and their disappointment prompted Jesus to make astounding claims about faith that can do the impossible. So we look at Matthew 17, 14 to 23. When they came to the crowd, a man approached Jesus and knelt before him. Lord, have mercy on my son, he said. He has seizures and is suffering greatly. He often falls into the fire or into water. I brought him to your disciples, but they couldn't heal him. You unbelieving and perverse generation, Jesus replied. How long shall I stay with you? How long shall I put up with you? Bring the boy here to me. Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of the boy, and he was healed at that moment. Then the disciples came to Jesus in private and asked, Why couldn't we drive out the demon? He replied, Because you have so little faith. Truly, I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Move from here to there. And it will move. Nothing will be impossible for you. When they came together in Galilee, he said to them, The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. They will kill him, and on the third day he will be raised to life. And the disciples were filled with grief. When I was younger, I thought that by now we would have flying cars and be visiting people on the moon. However, the only real progress in cars is uh, iPod docks and aircon. <laughs> on the other hand, however, the computing world's gone crazy. I had a Commodore 64 when I was a kid, and I thought nothing of having to load up a tape and wait half an hour for it to load up a nice 8 bit adventure. Uh, yeah, good times. But that is nothing compared to the phone I carry around in my pocket. If I wanted to, I could film a movie quality film, and while I still wandered down the streets, I could upload it straight onto the internet so that people in Azerbaijan could watch it. See, I thought my faith would be solid as a rock by now. That I've seen people brought back from the dead, I've seen people regrowing their legs. I had to admit, I'm a bit disappointed. 
that my faith is so inconsistent. I struggle to trust God over the smallest issues. I can easily relate to the disappointment of the disciples in this chapter. But their failure had not gone fixed. See, just before this chapter, Jesus had popped up on a mountain nearby with Peter, James and John. During this time, the rest of the disciples had failed miserably. A desperate dad had approached the disciples looking for a miracle. His son had um, suffered from seizures, um, but it seems that they were more than just purely physical condition. The boy was throwing himself into fire and into water. An evil spirit had entered the boy and was seeking to, to destroy him. In Jesus' absence, the disciples had a choice, to leave it alone or to go it alone. The father would have been begging them to offer whatever help they could. After all, the disciples had been commissioned to do this type of thing. But in Matthew chapter 10, verse 1, Jesus called his twelve disciples to, to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. But the disciples failed the exorcism, leaving the father even more distraught than before. Jesus had sent the disciples out as an advanced party into the towns and villages, letting the people know that he was around and announcing God's kingly reign had come to earth. So Jesus expected the disciples to be able to get on with things when he wasn't looking over their shoulder. He didn't micromanage them, he didn't mother them. Right from the beginning, discipleship meant action. And so the disciples should have had more than enough faith when the father brought in his son. But things got worse. Not only had they been left behind by Jesus, they had failed to heal the boy, they had upset the father, they got teased by the crowd, and now they had to face Jesus' criticism. Finally, thoroughly defeated, they asked Jesus why they couldn't heal the boy. There was a lot of disappointed people, and the disciples were to blame. Often for us, this type of disappointment with God is tied up with the lack of miracles, with the lack of faith. The linking these two together has often come to some false conclusions. The first one we've come to is that the lack of faith is the reason we don't see healings. If we think God only heals when we have enough faith, it can lead us to the point where we are convinced it's our fault that God's not healed us, or even that it's our fault we're sick in the first place. The book of Job is evidence that our sin, or our lack of faith, is not necessarily the root cause of the bad things that happen to us. Have a look at Paul, a man of great faith. He didn't have his sickness healed. The reason for his unanswered prayer was, in his own words, Therefore, in, either to, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This passage comes into one of my favourite bits from the Bible, because it's not often that you get a name check in there. When Peter Thorne talks about having a thorn in the flesh. Alright, it's not the best name reference, but nonetheless, I'm in there. Kind of. Um, let's move swiftly on. That was bad. <laughs> <laughs> um, another one we think is that, a false conclusion we come to is that a lack of faith limits Jesus' power. So in Matthew 13, 58, we're told that when Jesus went back to his hometown, he was not able to perform many miracles there because of their lack of faith. This seems to imply that faith levels limit Jesus' power. But we know that Jesus' power is unlimited. He's the same God that created the earth, the universe even. And there's nothing we can offer Jesus, even faith, that can somehow supercharge his powers. Jesus isn't dependent on us for anything. If Jesus is not short in power, then it follows that his restriction of miracles in his hometown was a deliberate choice. Perhaps he knew it was counterproductive to perform acts of power when there was no faith in the audience. It would only serve, serve as a travelling circus and attract a crowd rather than followers. See, many other times we see Jesus telling people not to tell others about the healing that he just performed for them, probably for similar reasons. So what went wrong with the disciples? They were not short on power because they had been commissioned and empowered by Jesus to heal and drive out demons. They should have been able to use this gifting. Jesus' words indicate that they were short of faith. So short, in fact, that they had actually failed to believe. Jesus put down, lumps together the crowd and the disciples. You unbelieving generation. Their culture didn't expect God to be active in their midst. And the disciples had begun to think the same. 
familiar does that sound to us? More so, they had failed to trust Jesus alone. Their question, why couldn't we drive out the demon, shows that they were attempting to do the miracle themselves. It's too easy for us today to find ourselves in the same trap. Without noticing, we blend into our surroundings and become shaped by culture. The approach we should be taking is to engage with the culture just like Jesus did. And his approach is three-pronged, like any good PowerPoint should be. Encouraging, challenging and transforming. Jesus doesn't suggest the disciples lock themselves in the monastery or even in church committee meetings. He models a way of positively engaging with the culture. Throughout the New Testament, we see him celebrating weddings, keeping up with current events. We see him using familiar language and relevant stories when he was talking about spiritual things. But Jesus is not afraid to challenge the negative aspects of a culture. He overturned the money tables in the temple. He points the finger at the hypocritical Pharisees and the unbelieving disciples. He chats to the loose Samaritan woman, the kind that's even worse than the ones that are on daytime TV. Jesus uses many examples to bring transformation. Water to wine, cripples to walking, fishermen, tax collectors and prostitutes to disciples. This is the model Jesus expects us to follow, aware of what we need to uphold, challenge or transform, whilst remaining consistently connected with Jesus throughout. It's surprising that Jesus said to the disciples that they have no faith. They had Jesus with them. They witnessed him perform hundreds of miracles and heard his teaching every day. But they still didn't believe. This is reassuring for those of us that struggle to believe sometimes. Then again, on the other hand, we're far better off than those disciples are. I mean, we know what happens at the cross. We know about the resurrection. We know about the Holy Spirit. And if we're genuine disciples, we've received his empowering presence in our life. If we know all of this and still fail to believe that God can act, our unbelief can't really be excused. Back in the passage... Jesus, without any fuss, heals the boy and drives the demon out. Then he finds a private place to deal with the disciples' disappointment and their disbelief. The Bible doesn't give us full details, but the scene was probably like this. With their failure overshadowing them and their heads hanging low, Jesus makes the disciples take a good look around. It's the end of the day, the sun's setting over the wonderful mountainscape. He gets them to look up at the giant mountain. Then he gets him to have a look at the tiny mustard seed that he happens to have on him. <laughs> a really big thing. Teeny tiny little thing. And he says, faith, as small as that mustard seed, can move something as massive as that mountain. Mountains represent a challenge. Like our own apparently impossible problems. Illness, a difficult relationship, financial difficulties, may overshadow a whole life. Or global problems such as people trafficking, genocide, AIDS, seem as immovable as Everest. Our faith may feel minuscule in comparison, like a mustard seed or a grain of sand. Many Christians face overwhelming problems and are told to just put them to one side or forget about them. But Jesus offers no such superficial help. He knows he's about to die in the next day or so, but he doesn't downplay our problems. Though, to be fair, I'd be alright if he did at that point. He states that even the tiniest bit of faith can move an entire mountain. The issue is not that our problems are too big for Jesus to deal with, or that our faith is too small for Jesus to use. The only question is whether we have faith at all. Faith is the connection that links our seemingly immovable problems with the supernatural, immeasurable power of God. <coughs> we are responsible for that connection, however weak. When the crowds and the circumstances are against us, do we trust in him? when it seems that he's left us alone. Faith links us to the one who is able to do the impossible. Like we reach out in faith when we pray. But God doesn't always move the mountains in our life and in our world. We prove our faith by trusting God despite these disappointments. We may have to live with unanswered prayer, but the God who made the mountains of this world is watching over us and ensuring our ultimate destiny. One of the most powerful encouragements in dealing with unanswered prayer is the end of Habakkuk, after he's dealt with a lot of struggles. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there's no grapes in the vines, though the olive crop fails, and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, and no cows in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Saviour. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to tread on the heights. 
for the director of music on stringed instruments. <laughs> Just a, a little note there in case you fancy singing. So in other words, continued trust in our awesome God allows us to climb the mountains when we can't move them. So what I've got now is a couple of questiony, pointy things here. So we're going to take some time. Um, the first three are kind of more personal ones, so you can think about them yourselves. If you want to discuss with the groups, that's fine. If not, that's fine too. Um, and then we've got some group discussion points. You can have a wee run through and have a chat about those. Use these as start points to discuss some things that you want to from these. Um, and also you can go and grab a, another cuppa during this point. Now's a good time. So we'll stick on some music and um, let's get chatting on that. Thanks.